right. So welcome everyone. This is our finale for Six Dummies Week here at UConn. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Jason Chedek. I'm Associate Professor of History and Asian American Studies and I'm Director of the Asian and Asian American Studies Institute here. Uh, we're really proud of offering this week-long extended academic study of Sikh history, culture, politics, and uh, and so in our finale, we had to include Professor Indapal Greatwall, who is uh, someone who was a big part of my academic preparation as a graduate student at Berkeley, uh, and and now we we have her here with us to um, talk about visual culture, talk about partition, uh, and the different ways that images can move us. Um, and so let, first I want to just help you understand who our guest is. Um, she is you know, Professor Emeritus of Women, Gender, and Sexuality Studies at Yale University. She's also a professor in the Ethnic and Ethnicity, Race, and Migration Studies program, the South Asian Studies Council, and an affiliate faculty in the American Studies program. She's one of the founders of the field of transnational feminist studies and known for prolific work on transnational feminism, cultural theory, feminist theory, and her extensive research on post-colonialism, South Asian cultural studies, mobility and modernity, non-governmental organization, human rights, law and citizenship. Um, he is the author of so many books that I can't, I don't have time to, to, to explain um, to you, but her work has really shaped multiple generations of scholarship and, uh, and continues to, uh, to give us generative ideas for how we apply feminist theory to understanding transnational uh, cultural uh, formations. Um, her work in uh, scattered hegemonies, postmodernity, and transnationalism feminist practices was a huge book for me in, in, uh, in graduate school that taught me uh, important analytical lenses that still that remain uh, important for, for my work. Uh, and many others. Uh, it's just maybe one one text um, of Professor Greenwald's work that's been influential on me. Uh, her ongoing publications and projects include essays on feminist theory, on European and American imperialisms, on visual culture of gender, violence, and counterinsurgency in India, and a book project on memoirs of bureaucrats in postcolonial India. Uh, so as our finale, we have uh, this Amazing lecture, which we will uh, will have uh, from Professor Gridwall, and followed by a Q and A. Uh, and with that, I want to invite you up, Professor Gridwall. It's been so lovely to have you here on campus, despite the rain. Uh, it, it's, uh, so this is uh, this is a tremendous uh, opportunity for us to host you and to have your work represented in. Uh, in our uh, our array of uh, uh, speakers for Six Studies Week. So thank you. Jason, thank you so much, Professor Chen, for inviting me here. And thank you all for coming on this really um, unexpectedly rainy day. I'm glad you are all here. Um, I want to thank the Institute for Asian American and Asian Studies, Asian and Asian American Studies also for hosting me. I'm delighted to be part of your ongoing week on six studies and just so, so delighted to be part of that. So thank you. Um, a little trigger warning about the images that there are one or two that are a little disturbing and I just want to put that out there now for everyone uh, to know. I tried to um, find images that were not going to be disturbing, but one or two I have to include. So let me begin. But I'm going to talk about the kind of idea of communal violence, 
that is talked about a great deal when we're talking about uh, violence within communities in India. A little bit about the history of that as well, drawn from the historians. Actually. So let me begin with talking about very recent events. According to the New York Times, this September 18, 2023, Dustin Trudeau, Canada's Prime Minister, announced in the Canadian House of Commons that agents of the government of India had carried out the assassination of Hamid Signijal in Surrey, British Columbia, when Surrey is a suburb of British Columbia, of Vancouver, in June 2023. The Canadian government said they had evidence to prove that the Indian government had assassinated and ordered the assassination of Mr. Niger, and it protested the violation of Canadian sovereignty and this rule of law by the Indian government. It seems Niger had been speaking very openly about this outcome himself, since the Indian government had apparently declared him a terrorist for his political support for Palestine as the separate Sikh state. Two other Sikh men, both accused of being Palestinians, have also dried mysteriously, one in Birmingham, UK, and one in Pakistan. When PM Trudeau brought up the issue with Indian Prime Minister Modi during the G20 meeting in Delhi in early September, the latter accused Canadian PM of not doing enough to quell anti-India sentiment in Canada, according to BBC reporting. Given that minorities, such as Sikhs, Muslims, and Christians, are often targeted by calling them anti-nationals or militants or terrorists, it is interesting that the Canadian government in retaliation expelled the consular head of the Indian Secret Service who was based in, uh, in Canada, the, in the capital. This, or, this, this Secret Service is known as RAW, R-A-W. It has been responsible for much of this targeting of so-called terrorists in India under the Indian government's continued anti-terrorism policy, which has also been supported globally by the likes of the U.S. government, which has exported anti-terrorist policy all over the world. While it seems that U.S. intelligence alerted Canada to the Indian government's hand in the killing, it is also important to note that U.S. anti-terror policies globally have empowered authoritarian governments around the world to target any opposition by calling it terrorism. Researching this project of state government, many of us have researchers call this a project we call securitization project, right? And we've come to define something called we call the security state, in which governments think this project of security is more important than looking after the welfare of its population. So in the case of India, for instance, development takes a backseat to security, right? And so welfare is less important than security. Um, securitizing operates from masculine notions of protection to connect the protection of the nation with protection of home, protection of family. So it becomes a patriarchal logic. The sums that governments spend in securitizing is not small. For instance, the costs of war project at Brown University fights for the U.S. sponsored war on terror has by now cost $8 trillion, killed about a million people directly, 3.6 to 3.8 million indirectly, half a million civilian deaths, displaced 38 million people globally, and in the unsettled the Middle East and South Asia. It's only now that the U.S. government finds that when white Christian nationals are more likely to be behind attacks on civilians, but we have some retrospection about this issue. And those sums, that numbers that I mentioned, don't get at the multi-generation traumas and displacements caused by these kind of counter-terrorism and security policies. I bring up this issue of targeting of six to remind us that in our interconnected world, narratives of anti-terrorism and security circulate across national boundaries. For minorities in India or in diaspora, the assassination creates fear and prevents freedom of speech. It also draws attention, paradoxically, to the way that the rule of law is violated by so many governments, including the U.S. Um, so, 
for some people, that this happens at this point in time by the Indian government might mean that this is a, an election year's ploy, that the Modi government is using it to draw more people into his fold by targeting so-called Sikh terrorists. And they, they've been doing this for a while now. Punjab. While Canada might be able to enhance its image as that of a multicultural nation, showing how it treats and minorities with respect, it also often violates its own rules of law by state and police violence against indigenous First Nations communities. Given this history of police violence in Canada, the complex calculation by which Sikh Committee and head of the New Democratic Party, Jagmeet Singh, flexes his Canadian nationalist muscle is interesting. In his remarks on September 18, 2023, he said, the assassination shocks the safety and security of Canadians. That's claiming that Canada is a space of refuge for anyone suffering from a rights violation. It has been so for many six, but not for many of the First Nations communities. Um, so this is probably a difficult path for Jimmy Singh to take as a turban sick man to rise up in the political party itself is very admirable. And we know from the history of Indian American studies that often the national position is white minorities and Asian Americans have taken in order to protect their own community. So it's a very complex historical um, um, way of dealing with the situation. Yet the bigger question for me and for many of us as scholars is how do we come to see fellow citizens as aliens, as terrorists? And as threats. The phrase ways of saying was spoken by British activist and art critic John Berger, who argued that the power can manipulate how we look at images in order to preserve their own power. How we learn to look at minorities, how we learn to look at violence, it's so important to understand the role of power today, since these images are everywhere. If you look at YouTube, if you look at Instagram, if you look at something that we now call X, it's there everywhere, right? So how is some it's sort of how we learn to look at minorities important to understand power at the state today, whether it is Muslims or Sikhs in Canada or indigenous women or black men in the United States. It's more about how we look at people than people being looked at. For instance, we see many media narratives and images of so called caravans of migrants and migrants' bloods of coming into countries which are believed to be overwhelmed by the numbers, and I do this to quote, right? The numbers of migrants. And those kinds of uh, 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 phrasings and the rhetoric tells us more about America and the West than they tell us about people trying to cross the border into safety. So constructing how we look is a very important part of power today. So it's important to understand then how the Indian government was successful in making other Sikhs uh, become visible only as militants or terrorists, right? And I'm going to do that today. First, I will begin by talking about the problem of colonial ways of seeing, the way in which the, use, the word colonial is used to describe violence in India, showing and always created by communities rather than the colonial state itself, right? And today, the word then suggests that all communities are violent, rather than showing there's a majority community using violence to keep down a minority. It sort of suggests that all communities are equally responsible for the violence, right? So we have not just the language of communalism, but the, commun the language of Riots, for instance, suggest the same thing, that there are riots. It doesn't mean that somebody's instigating. It, it doesn't mean there's a spontaneous uprising that people have risen up against their leaders, right? And that's something we need to question. The second thing I'm going to talk about, other than communalism, is the kind of notion of objectivity in photojournalism, also as an ideology, right? And the way in which objectivity in the history of photojournalism in India, of India, aiming to show the violence of the partition. And I'm going to end with talking about how artists try to look 
at some of these same events of violence and try to change the way we see it. So that's what I'm going to talk about. So the term communal is often used to describe any kind of intercommunity violence in India. And to this day, you will see this word used so much. In the New York Times will have it, all the Indian newspapers will have it, everybody will have the word, right? They'll speak of mobs and riots and spontaneous uprising. This, I, this language of communal, as the historian Gyan Pante has argued so well, began with the British colonial state which for often put into policy and practice the argument that the violence in India was a result of long-standing enmity between communities rather than the use of violence by the British state in dividing communities, right? Or the violence used by the British on communities. And they did this in order to govern. One way it was doing this through the racial narrative that came out through the news media that all Indians were irrational they were prone to all kinds of atavistic behavior, that their religion turned them into fanatics, and that fanaticism was the source of violence between communities. This is a, like a racial language used by the British. This was an outrageous argument given the history of Christianity, which we all know, but it circulated because of the many entities that accepted it. That communities lived together, for the most part, and that all sorts of kings and rulers were often violent and sometimes not. And that all of them had some religious identity, but they also had hosts of other people in their in their ports was left out of much historical record. The second thing is religion was defined by the British solely in terms of a single identity, rather based on a single test, rather than on understanding of history of uh, the history of practices of religion. R.B. Bhagat argued that the British introduced the census in India in 1872 and included religious identity in its question, resulting in a rise of identitarian Muslim Hindu polarization that continues to this day. It makes this argument. It's an interesting and important one to consider what the census does and how we know from our time that census identity categories are often not that relevant to the everyday lives of people. When religious identities remain powerful into the present, we need to understand those outside the notion of this communal idea. For example, in diaspora, we live next to each other and are bound together by shared politics, language, and cultural affinities. The U.S. is unusual historically in that regard. We see from the history of Asian American studies that the problem of facing a common racial bias brings people together to address a problem. Asian American organizations, for instance, work for so many different religious groups. And I was just talking to Jay, Jason about the Asian law conference in San Francisco with a long, long history of, of uh, this bringing, talking about all kinds of refugee issues. Asian Americans, uh, these organizations have a diversity that gives them a shared culture of coexistence. Today, some of this has been torn apart by national politics. People who insist on the right to practice their own minority religion in diaspora are invested in denying that right to people, what do you say, back from the places that they left and to which they have no intention of returning. You can see the in Trumpian rhetoric of it to bridge it around what's very for instance. Um, similarly, people in Punjab live together with a shared language and shared practices of worship. So many different origin groups of people go to the Golden Temple. They have bridge that. Um, people have festivals together. Some identify um, also as belonging to different saints, followers of different saints. We have now in Punjab, the census figures tell us the rise of the Ravi Dasi community is very large, and Ravi Dasis have their own good dwellers, for instance, even in diaspora. So, two ways of thinking about Punjab and religion that communalism is conflict between groups and that religion is a single, unchanging identity has led to stereotypes such as the Sikhs of rural Punjab who the central government, starting with Mrs. Indira Gandhi, criminalized by calling them militants, extremists, or terrorists. 
What the Canadians have said, diasporic states of North America have to contend with those stereotypes as they are brought here by various governments, as well as their other identities, such as ethnic, racialized, people of color, multicultural, et cetera, right? With their own problems of race that they have to deal with. In such problems of image making, photojournalism has played a major role. Photojournalism gained power by adding another racial ideology in the 20th century, that of objectivity as enabling the discovery of truths about other cultures and histories. In the age of news media and the advent of photography in the late 19th and early 20th century, photojournalism became the vehicle to convey the subjectivity through images and captions. In particular, photojournalism proposed an objectivity that was to convey immediacy and veracity that it is really the photojournalist captures the truth of something as it is happening. The journalist is seen to be objective and present in the scene of violence, and his images are taken to be the truth of an event. And they're mostly, they were mostly men. The history of Portland journalism has also, however, showed us how scenes were created. Some of them were staged and images edited to produce a particular notion of objectivity. We see this even more so, and we have to worry about this with uh, digital photography and AI and what we have faced today. So given the imposition of colonial and the post-colonial states ways of seeing, as we call it, artists step in where photojournalists fail because they understand that photographs can be put in the service of power. If photojournalism has to be examined carefully because power of state of capital behind media means that there is a preference for some stories of others to cover some communities over others, right? There's money behind photojournalism today. Artists, however, cannot claim to be objective. The best seem to be truthful to some perspective rather than objective, truthful to a kind of what they see as the truth of the situation. In addition, photographs of state violence are circulating, and it does not mean that because they circulate that there is youth, there's youth universal condemnation of the violence. We know that photographs of atrocities, such as in war, can be used to claim victory as much as to provide evidence of violence. However, as Terry Stewart always pointed out, if images are encoded with dominant ways of seeing, they can also be decoded in a variety of ways. So the artists, the challenge for artists, especially those who work with photographs like the artists I'll be talking about that we give, has been, has been to make the photographs speak against power and the state. So let me turn to a very brief history of ways photojournalism has the part in the long history of what has been called uh, communal violence in India, some images have become iconic, globally iconic. The making of Indian and Pakistan includes such images. We all have seen them, especially in the violence of protection. If we try to understand the history of looking at images of violence in India and Pakistan and South Asia, we have to sort of begin with the kind of history of looking at partition too. And we have to look at the environment photographs of the post-colonial state and the work of American photographer for Life magazine, Margaret Borkwright. This might be a beginning to talk about uh, uh, images. Two photographs have become noteworthy in that history of partition photography, Sunil Jana and Margaret Borkwright. Jana took, also took pictures, photographs of the Bengal famine, 1943. It was a Bengali. Uh, from Kolkata, and uh, I think she was from um, what is now um, it's Bangladesh. And his images, he came to work as a communist, he was a socialist, so his images are very different. Both these photographs of journalists did reveal the tragic uh, aspects of the partition, right? Yet it is four points images that have remained like that's something to think about. 
In more points photographs, you can see the way the colonial notion of communal violence structures and images. More white was sent to record the emerging of the dependent Indian nations, which was sent to India in 47. Her images have become, as I said, part of the visual history of the partition. They help produce the image of Bork White as a star photojournalist, an intrepid adventurer and reporter. Her images are hugely influential in the history of photographic journalism, of wartime and violence, especially of the global south, by including dying and suffering women. Children and old people. It's important to record this violence in which over a million people perished, leaving generations to come with intergenerations trauma. But it's important to understand how the photographs do not help us to understand how that violence came about, right? And how it was caused. Of Bork White's partition photographs, there are many that focused on caravans and lines of people walking and carrying each other, moving across the border. Some of these do express the sense of an action of the move, on mobilizing itself to move to independence. Yet others capture the suffering of women as they sit, sleep, breastfeed their children and represent the female and objective side of the emerging nation. They're without the men in their families, and we know so much of the violence was carried out against women and men in very different ways. Uh, men by outright killing and women by consistent kidnapping and rape. Um, they are without the men of their families. That Bork White's ability to capture the silent misery of women is striking. Through a camera in the tradition of Western photography, though her camera sees them as nameless persons typifying a violent event, she seems this to present this as a cultural event. It's difficult, however, even though to ignore the power of the image. The images are very striking, very powerful. So there are, I think, two reasons why her images reveal she relied on British colonial notions on so-called communal violence and leading to the violence of the partition. First, none of her photographs include images of the colonial state. Colonial bureaucrats, as they enabled, watched the violence, threw up their hands and left the country. She takes photos of the ceremony ending over on the country in the capital, but nothing that sees them as responsible for the violence. She says, for instance, in her autobiography, the splitting of India into two nations based on religious antagonisms has increased the deadly hatreds and fears. She blames then the violence on religious antagonisms rather than the conditions created by the British and their racial rule. Later, she calls those engaged in violence, in violence as religious terrorists. And her only mention of Edwin British is of a soldier assisting her and a captain who warns her to leave a particular place. It is remarkable, though, that it's the American who covered the violence. The British government, as we have learned later from historians, suppressed information and media coverage of the violence that was ongoing. The art historian, historian Donald Roy Chowdhury relates that neither the British nor the Indian media showed the photographs of violence as did Life magazine. Associated Press told its photographers that these were bodies inedible for British consumption. That a British publication would make that determination when its government itself was responsible for the tragic death of millions of other violence and the list of crimes of colonialism. The American editor of Life magazine, Wilson Hicks, gave Bork White the assignment to cover the tragic events, and she relates her experience, showing her excitement of being present at the birth of the nation, but also relating the miseries of what people she saw as she took the photographs. She juxtaposes accounts of those suffering violence with those of her meetings with Gandhi or Nehru or Jinnah in elite, private, and wealthy houses and spaces. The distancing gaze of the photojournalist allows her to see carnage and deaths and capture some of them in her photographs. So even she shies away from the worst effects of violence. Using distance and elevation to see crowds full of cards carrying people and families helping each other. The elimination of the British government, bureaucrats, militaries from the scene 
is part of a long history of ways of seeing violence in the global south as emerging from its own people, as emerging from that spontaneous mob, rather than the violence of colonial or post-colonial state. State violence is eliminated and replaced by cultural violence. Relatedly, the Bork White's iconic photograph of Mahatma Gandhi at the Spinnery has also become so iconic. I'm sure you've all seen it. In it, right? Um, it presents him also. He was a peacekeeper. He took on a fast to try to stop the violence from going on. But this shows him in a sort of different way as a Mahatma. It contributes to his making of his image as a saintly figure. He was, in fact, a lawyer a very effective one. And he was also then invested in his caste and Hindu identity, identities that remain dominant in India to this day, leading to violence against most subordinated communities, such as Dalits and Adivasis. So if we move now, Mr. Sambu jump some decades later. To later in the 20th century, another key event of so-called communal violence um, is the pogrom of six in Delhi in 1984. Here what we see is that a community of four six in the, the, in the Delhi slum of Tilokpuri, ironically, many who had been displaced moved from the, uh, because of the partition, become, they became victims of the violence. An example, made an example of so-called Hindu anger and the assassination of Prime Minister Dhar Gandhi by her Sikh bodyguard. To this day, such programs take place in poor communities of Muslims, Sikhs, and Christians and reveal the power of the Indian state. To return to 84, 1984, this was a time before the advent of digital media when radio and television were controlled by the government through one channel, Doodarshan, and print media was the only technology not only but somewhat under government control through the, through the dissemination of whoever the government would give newspaper print to, to the newspaper. And they advertised heavily in the newspaper, so the newspaper was supported by state. The news media has also been hegemonically aligned with dominant caste, religious, or class groups who came to see six as terroristic others at this period. The government of Indira Gandhi and the Congress Party had nurtured these beliefs over a period of time. These ideas combined with control over media seem that the coverage of 1984 was partial and problematic. News media focused on the cremation and mourning of Indra Gandhi in central Delhi while ignoring the carnage done by her party activists on this poor Sikh community, not even 10 miles away. A community that had nothing to do with either the uprising of Sikh separatism in Punjab nor the assassination of Gandhi. The BBC television news reported the assassination. Much of it from the reporter in Delhi, Mark Tully, spoke in racialized and orientalist terms of India's histories of religious hatred and strong feelings. And the image on BBC limited contemporaneous coverage of the pogrom to burning houses, though it later showed some destruction of sick homes and some dead bodies. Images from the archives of the Hindustan Times and other national daily showed police patrolling some regions of Delhi and burning houses. Such photographs belie the ways in which the police and Congress party bore responsibility for the violence. Later, state-sponsored commissions found that neither police nor military had come to the rescue of the Sikh communities. Also hidden from the media at the time, and what came to light later was the participation of the Congress party, this is in their Congress party, in the program. The Congress Party control of the central government did not just had not just created powerful stereotypes of Sikhs, but enabled the violence by handing out voter lists where Sikh houses were marked, and which served as the map for the Congress Party uh, cadres during the carnage. Later, the government protected the perpetrators from accountability, and they created something called the Nanamati Commission, which they the found that nobody was actually responsible for oh, right. Though much of the national media went along with the government account, as did much international media, there were others that did not ignore the pogrom, by happenstance, actually. The Indian Express, a national daily that had long opposed the Gandhi government, 
broke the news of the violence as it was happening, though someone by chance. Indian Express journalist Rahul Bedia later related that one of the victims, Mohan Singh, managed to read the office of the newspaper and Bedia then went to investigate and came up with to the The events of those days, during which 3,000 Sikhs were killed and women sexually assaulted, is remembered in narratives and accounts by survivors. In a kind of produced later in commissions of inquiry by the People's Union for Civil Liberties and other NGO groups, as well in some photographs by independent photojournalists and artists and scholars and researchers who came to the scene later on. If we understand the images of violence from a history of lynching and racial violence, we cannot attribute the violence to an unknown why in the Indian context. Since scholars have shown repeatedly that citation of this collectivity, often with racial and class connotations, obscures the culpability of powerful people. As the artist Gauri Gill says, false equivalences cover one sided pogroms and two sided riots. It is this ideological enabling context of the state as bystander that also produces a different notion of the post colonial state than that created by Warpoint. Even in the photographs of the Pogrom of 1684, we do not have any images of Congress or leaders who shared border lists. As the journalist and artist Melanjana Rowan tells us, someone took those lists and had them photocopied. Someone gave out the chalk to mark the houses of the six. She goes on to say, ironically, they had time to create the spontaneous the contextual work of such state-sponsored violence is to create communal identities which make groups of people available as perpetrators or victims, and terms such as mob violence are uh, cover over the identities of the perpetrators. Even images of perpetrators and victims offer no clues as to those who actually instigate the violence. This could be bureaucrats and offices, it could be politicians and cultural places. Some photographs such as the one in Figure 5, are powerfully unstable in their effect of showing the abjection of the sick man and I've kind of What is notable is that when photographs of police become available as patrolling the streets after the violence has taken place, news media showed images of streets patrolled by police and tanks which were made to control the violence, or discovered later, or our as discovered later, were told by Congress party activists not to stop the violence. And this was a repeated structure that happened in 2002 in Gujarat as well. The state is both bystander and deliberately related to the violence. So you can see this happening in Assam as we speak, where communities are pitted against each other. Scholars, activists, and artists came to produce images and narratives of the program recording their memories from victims and witnesses. In the realm of visual culture, photographer Ram Rabban took an iconic photograph of a woman who he names Nagi Kaur, another of a sick man destroyed at the violence he has been subjected to, and I'm going to go through this really fast. So this is where Rahman says later, my pictures of that afternoon in 1984 were published in the Deccan Herald and the Herald Review. Now, these are newspapers that come out in South India, they're not in the center of the world. But which I was then working as a graphic designer. The Illustrated Retail of India trope published in large print. Now, this is important that we did. Many were used by the People's Union for Civil Liberties and the People's Union for Democratic Rights, two um, groups that were for civil liberties where all the photographs were printed anonymously. So he was very worried about his attacks on him. Uh, and Ram Raman is a very interesting photographer and artist who comes from a mixed family. Uh, and his father was Muslim, his mother body was a Hindu. In fact, it's very hard to find images of the 1984 violence now. My negatives were seen safely processed, and I made sure the multiple sets of prints they were made went to different cities and to different newspaper archives. And he went on to also say, this fear was a harbinger 
of what happened in Ayodhya in 1992. But not a signal, all photographers at the site were systematically attacked so they could capture no evidence of the Babri Masjid demolition and the people involved. The tragic lack of justice by the state then compelled artists and photographers to recirculate images, create new temporalities of witnessing decades after the violence. After 1984, as witnesses named the killers, the state worked to repress the evidence. It pressured witnesses to retract prolonged inquiries and trials for long periods of time. It protected the members of the ruling Congress party who had been recognized and named by the victims. As the artist Gauri Kim tells us, with only government run media, there are only eyewitness accounts of the violence. She went on, goes on to say, Photographers who documented the massacre that November were terrified that photographs would be made to disappear, even from photo labs in New Delhi, where they were sent for processing by the central government. She said images did disappear. Nilanjana Roy writes, the official memory of 1984 is a blank slate. A Godridge tail cabinet in your corners to is is an is an armoire type cupboard that very often, I don't know, people keep their valuables in it. Um, a Godric steel cabinet of wiped tapes when no voice does speak, reel after reel of exposed film, a uh, commission report that said nobody was to blame, nobody would be blamed. In response to this kind of erasure, and through a creation of what she calls a notebook of the violence, artist photographer Gauri Gill hopes to provide archival justice to have photographs of the survivors taken almost two decades later. Her photographs first appeared in the journal The Helkai Outlook, later in Kafkalar, which is an online um, a website, which is really um, interesting to follow. Um, they first appeared, in, this notebook appeared in 2013. Um, the notebook memorializes both the event and the denial of culpability by the Congress government in charge through the report of this very infamous Nanavati Commission that came out in 2005, the traumatic response to the report by both victims, survivors, and bystanders. Our work produces a temporality that's not just about the event or about witnessing, but about how knowledge and community reflection are critical. In our notebook entitled 1984, includes photographs of the survivors. This is the first page, which is her notes not speaking to um, the women survivors. In our notebook, she includes photographs of survivors taken in 2005, 2009, 2014, along with responses to the photographs of 35 artists, among which are writers, poets, and filmmakers, many of whom were in Delhi during a night at that time in life. The response is including memories of the events to prevent those from being forgotten, as well as anger, sorrow by this range of people from over different religious communities. She made the entire notebook available on her website, and she said, free to download, print out, staple, distribute. And in order to ensure the widest dissemination, she first purposefully designed the book to fit an 84 sheet so it can be printed out, folding, and stapled to form the book. The online version has remained free to download, so she's now published a book version. What is remarkable about her photograph and the writing of the collaborating artist is that they comment on witnessing not the program, but the events that make up survival, resistance, or protest against the inaction of the government, in particular the Nanavati Commission, as I mentioned. They record the trauma of both victims and ordinary citizens of Delhi who were appalled at the program and words to stand witness and go help the survivors. They record the difficulty of getting justice against the perpetrators and the wonderful and inadequate sums of money given to survivors who continue to live with trauma and in poverty. The cover page of the notebook here, as a picture, records transparent fragments of narrative from and the her interviews with women survivors, the widows of Drilo Puri, who state they will not forget, they are sure they will not get justice. 
a subsequent set of photographs of the women survivors is captured as um, is captured at the widows of Block 32, Trilopuri, on the morning after the Nanavati Commission report is released, right, when they realize that there's the commission is not going to tell the truth. Gail presents not just one photograph of the truth, but several as she takes multiple shots of the group. And it's interesting because photographers often take multiple shots, but they don't often put them in here, right? So what she's doing is she's showing you her whole set of photographs as if to show that repeatedly, even though they may change a little bit, the women's day in, in some ways. In the they show the resignation of the survivors, old women, and the other photographs show young men, children, workers, all clearly not wealthy, posed within or in front of modest dwellings, decorated with photographic portraits of those killed. Right? Um, Gill's collaborative project and her practices of collaboration in all of her work, as if her photographs seem never enough to do what she wants them to do. So she's always collaborating with writers, with other people's perspectives, with captions that are different, with um, painting over her photographs. She's always doing something like that as a collective way to look at the violence. As a collective, the emotions gathered are diverse. Anger, sorrow, trauma, shame, questioning, introspection, resignation. Against the divisive politics of the post-colonial state, she tries to, pos uh, to, uh, to present the collectivity against that violence. In the case of communalism in India, the visualization of violence with this history of capitalist and corporate reliance on the icon and the spectacle also redirects our attention away from those images that would undermine the state's move towards authoritarian power. Iconic images linked to the history of visuality that have emerged in post-colonial India. They emerge, uh, emerge as witnessing the suffering of victims rather than confronting the culpability of the state that continues to make the least powerful suffer the most. For Gil, it is the combination of commentary, memories, and photographs that lead us in showing this violence. Yet I find her notebook incredibly moving as an example of the collectivity that she presents as what can and should be being the way in which citizens deal with social justice rather than securitization. And this is sort of suggests that politics as a way out of the, the boxes of the state's ways of saying. So any questions? Yeah, but here. My name is Ben. I'm a history teaching major, major so I'm trying to become a history teacher. Um, I do have one question about the Sikh identity itself. Um, so you're, you've been mentioning that there's always been a form of discrimination as it is a minority, and in recent memory that discrimination has continued, and with the assassination that just occurred in British Columbia a few months ago, do you personally believe like the Indian government is doing like any like cultural genocide against the Sikh community or do you feel like it's just very strong discrimination by the people itself? So that's a really great question. So thank you for that question. Um, states are, so many states are turning towards authoritarianism and they're very much uh, trying to impose state power on people, some by using populism, you know, some by outright violence and repression against uh, around whoever they seem to be against them, right? One thing that's happened in India, I think, and historians have written about it, uh, Gyan Pukosh, for instance, has written about how since the Indira Gandhi's uh, go government in the 1970s, there was a shift from the Nehruvian notion, Nehru's inaugural, who was the first prime minister of India, and Indira Gandhi is his daughter, actually, 
from Nehru's vision of a plural democracy, though one can look back and argue that that vision of a plural democracy was still vitalist Hindus as the dominant group, that that, if, though he did profess a kind of notion of pluralism as, the, as what India is all about, unity and diversity, all that, his daughter in their Gandhi moved to politics of separation as a way to gain power, right? And what she did was create this notion of Sikhs, because it's also Punjab is a border state, um, to do two things, to show the animus against Pakistan, and then to, to kind of repress what she saw was a restive kind of insurgent movement, right? And she, so those two things were what she was after. Um, and so she created these policies that, that went on to have um, a tremendous effects. You know, she ordered the attack on the Golden Temple, for instance, um, and that made six very, very angry. So even though you have, you don't have the, the insurgent movement itself incorporating all six, all six we can unify after the attack on the Golden Temple, right? The fact her, her own practice then unified a, a community um, in a different way. And so that's what I think happened. The current government is, has yet another set of policies. And this government is about, it comes from the RSS, which is uh, a, a movement of Hindu nationalism that came about in the early 20th century, uh, which argues for a muscular Hindu group, uh, the RSS. And it, uh, you know, it, 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 it uh, believes that uh, in the politics of Nazi rule, for instance, uh, and it really subscribed to the idea that Hindus need to rise up and they're the rightful owners of the land and that everybody else should live as a minority, as a subservient, second class citizens without the rights and uh, duties of others, but the Hindus. Now, the problem is the Hindus are not identified as a group. The South is also very different from the North. And so there's always problems with identifying that category itself. Um, so, but what you have is in the most populous states and in the states that are governed by the BJP, you have repeated attacks on Muslims. So Muslims are now seen as aliens, almost 200 million of them. Uh, we live in a dare seen as aliens uh, to the to the you know to the proper uh, owners of the land, um, and so that has led to pogroms and lots of bulldozing of all the houses and the communities of Muslims that are ongoing. Right, the U.S. turns a blind eye because it wants India as a partner against China. With the earlier, the U.S. wanted to use Pakistan as a ally against that didn't work. So now it's it's you know it's using India. So that has many many problems that are rising. Many people think that it's this attack on Niger is the next year politicking the election the next year, and so what Modi is trying to do is ride up people to vote because he calls himself in the last election, they called himself the chalky, the, the protector, the watchman. So that's what he's doing. Okay. So the rule, the how they rule is different. And all becomes the other is different, right? But then some of the othering continues on and then the U.S. anti-terror policies have been just I am Kate Arba, professor in English and Africana Studies. Um, you, thank you so much for this talk. You've given us so much to think about about the politics and also the aesthetics of what you're describing. So my question is a little bit about the aesthetics. Um, since you had mentioned the form of photography and um, objectivity, and then I loved what you were doing with um, the gill images and collectivity. Is there something to be said about the photograph and the kind of qualities of the photographs, the way we think about photographs? Just to align with that political project of presenting collectivity. Okay. 
So I really wanted to, that's a really great question too. I really wanted to think about photographs as photojournalists created by photojournalists, how the photographs created by artists, and think about how they are, are somewhat quite different. Sometimes the photojournalists capture some photographs that become iconic, that captures an emotion in a particular kind of way. Um, and, but the artists are always trying to do that in the photographs that they take. So I think the, in the aesthetic practices of the artists who are photographers uh, tend to be a bit different. That's the case with Ron Bonds and Legends. Um, so Neil and I is, uh, you know, and a whole other very, very interesting story. And I still have a bunch of research to go on here. But, um, but Bork White, of course, is very well known. Um, so, uh, you know, she's a modernist photographer. She takes modern America, the state of building, the, uh, the uh, iconic Chrysler building, her very famous photographs. And these sort of develop her chops as a kind of big photojournalist of the Global South. But I really think it does something for capturing the silent suffering of the Global South woman that begins at this point in time. Um, and I really want to work more on that as I think about these photographs. Gail is, I find, absolutely fascinating because she's always collaborating, always. She's just, the one where she hasn't collaborated is the most recent set of photograph, photographs she's done of the farmer's protest, which actually was commissioned by the Victoria and Albert Museum. So if you go to the website of the Victoria and Albert Museum, you'll see them. They are the most stunning photographs of the habitations that farmers created at the limb for over a year on the streets outside of Delhi. And they are incredible photographs of how they live. And there aren't that many people in them, but they're really interesting to see the ingenuity, the, the kind of way in which tractors are and, and trucks are engineered to become houses, the way in which cooking is done, the way in which, you know, thick practices of shared food because it's shared dinners and meals are then made and are incorporated into the streets of Delhi. They're most incredibly good thing. But all of her other work is in collaboration. She just today I heard one another prize for something. Um, so she does a lot of collaborative and interesting work. And and I want to say more I mean I'm writing more about her so I'm thinking about her collaboration, and I feel that she's very uh, often very unsatisfied with what the photograph can do by itself. I have nice questions too. <laughs> um, okay, so I really appreciate it. So one is about the communal violence part, and the other one is about Gail Sassaga. There's a quote on the on that page that I wanted to ask you about, and aesthetic practices related to healing. And so the, the first part about communal violence, I found it so fascinating that, you know, the way that it's described in order to make state relations invisible, right? Um, and in my own work in thinking about uh, racial violence, I have used this concept that's kind of like, um, I, I call it uh, grotesque assemblies. And it's kind of like it, enacting a new social order in moments of violence. And that in that violence, norms are suspended in order to produce this new world. And, um, and what I have found kind of unsatisfying unsatisfying from that analysis was that um, that it didn't seem to be that was sort of momentary right and I like how your attention to communal violence is always about making the making communities appear that aren't there and that violence is one way that they're made to appear right um, but I think there's what you point out so well is the, the crisis of the state 
is always trying to manufacture communities, right? There are stories about them. Uh, so I thought that was just really useful for me to think through and, and the case that the, the, the examples that you gave were so um, illustrative. And so shifting to the other part, the quote that I saw in there was, our children will fight our battle. And, and it's so heartbreaking to hear that, to see that written and to understand like that, that mindset, we'll, we will never get justice. And that they will be intergenerational, right? Um, so, like the question too about about images. So images can do violence, right? But they can they also do can also facilitate healing and memory connection. And I think that's what you were pointing out at the end. Um, so I just wanted to hear you think with us about uh, what is a kind of aesthetic practice that is oriented towards healing and justice in the midst of feeling that way, that our children will fight that battle, that, that kind of understanding. The, the thought about our children will fight the battle is that you see the images in the notebook, the children are struggling to survive, right? And, and what they did in, to resettle the people displaced from the military, get them their poorly ventilated houses, the inadequate sums of money given as compensation, which go nowhere, which don't help that much. So all of those people continue to live in poverty. Alan, we did so much unresolved trauma from the period that has been handed down to the next generation. So the next generation is then dealing with the trauma of their parents and grandparents, the survivors, right? And so there are no psychological services that are really helping deal with that as if psychological services can. That is also debatable, but they might go somewhere. Um, and so you so without that, then what is the healing that can be done? So the healing is, you know, the complicatedness of the messiness of the notebook, the memories of people, the civil liberties and civil justice people, the artists, the academics, the researcher, this cobbled together communities that that Gil is calling from her hardest friends and academic friends in Delhi to say that, yeah, we were there, you know, we went and helped and we tried to do our best. But then she, unlike those people, Tom goes repeatedly. And she, by asking people to write in the notebook, she asked people to reflect back their gifts back to, which people are not willing to do quite often, right? To reflect about that. And, and so there are, very poignant stories in the notebook, which I urge people to look at online, um, where some people look at the way in which the trauma is and of what happened to families that destroyed people. So like, you know, and some people saying, I'll never forgive my nation for this. Right? In my name, this was done. But I will never forgive them for doing that. Right? And so it's important to think both of what the artist tries to do and what they try to do in bringing these emotions to the forefront. They do more emotional work, I think, um, in their aesthetic practice and in the kind of... The photojournalist moves on. For them, it's not... It, the event is gone, right? They're not going to come back to it. So who's going to come back to it? It's the communities are left with it, the artists are left with it. So they they produce a different temporality to it, which is important um, for communities. And it's important for communities to remember because the race, the state repeats this over and over and over. Not just turning six that's one part of it. 
like who's the other, how to make somebody into the other, uh, but the violence over and over and over in the post colonial state. Yes. My name is Kuljit Sekhalsa. Uh, I'm from Wellington, Connecticut. So the way it's happening right now, she mentioned about the the murder happened in the Saudi BC. Just because of that happened, and uh, just Trudeau says all these things about the involvement of India in in the case. Now, if, if you look at the Twitter and all the X and stuff, you'll see the all of the you know I don't know what to call it. People from India who kind of paid six, they always mention about the 1984. Don't forget 1984, what we did with you guys. Even now. Uh, yesterday, we saw a Twitter or maybe an Instagram. Somebody from Punjab mentioned that keep asking the people collect the kerosene, collect the tires. So we're going to show the six again 1984. So these things are happening back after that many years. You know, the <clears throat> about the communal only thing we were talking about. The thing is, you know, my wife was born in New Delhi at that time. She was born in 81. She was three years old. Her family was there. Even this family was there too. You know, at that time. And then her younger brother, her younger brother was two years old. We used to have a long hair, put the bun on the top. Just to be on the safe side, they had to cut their hair to pretend that, you know, he's not the Sikh. So even communal violence is done by the government. Even the neighboring Hindu families help the, each other. That's what happened. It's not like we're not blaming the Hindu people done this. It's just the Indian government just to kill the Sikhs. It was the genocide. Even in Connecticut passed the bill, 1984. It was the genocide. So these things are happening. You know, when, you know, we can, you know, that's even till now. My in-laws family lost hundred thousand. You know, they have the transportation business at that time. You know, they have to leave everything in New Delhi and go back to Punjab. You know, they are. I still remember. You know. I had the friends, you know, their business were burned down, you know. One of my friends, his dad was burned down. He was like, you know, he's older, he was older than mine. I think like he's seven, 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 eight years old when he saw all these things. So, you know, we, you know, the deep state in India, as uh, the way you were mentioning that, they have these things that to build the minorities and be a, one nation, one government thing. The thing happened in Manipur right now, you know, the, all these things happening. Even now, till now, I mean, everything, all over India, these things are happening about the criminal you know, violence and stuff, killing, butchering, with all these things are still happening. Then, because there was another thing that was mentioned. I guess that's it. Thank you. I also have a quick question. First of all, thank you for coming here today. I wish you had a little more time so we could show you our seat, our gallery. Uh, for the purpose of Zoom, I have scrolled seats in Kalsa from Norwich. Uh, what do you think about how important it is to acknowledge the history of the way it has happened? And uh, does these kind of acknowledgement of history or the narratives things have happened help in healing or help in closure to the community? In the state of Connecticut, we have worked very closely with our legislators and November 1st has been recognized and as a seat to us at your member state. And we are the only state in America in which the bill was passed in House, then in Senate, then signed by the government. And we have seen what kind of Indian interference happened when we do these kind of efforts. And there has been intimidation to Sikhs in Connecticut from various different media campaigns. And of course, they will write letters. Indian consulates of New York wrote letters to our legislator as well to intimidate us as well. And to again tell that Sikhs are militants and uh, 
One actually comes that General told one of the important leader in Connecticut, high high level leader, that only five people died in 1984, and how come you have recognized it as a genocide? So when I talked to that state leader, I was like, what did you told him? She said, she said that I only told him, give me in Britain. I was like, maybe we will give you those five names, because right now if you go on uh, in soft website, there are also more than 5,000 people with the pictures, with the village name, with the age. And, 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 and that is just a very small number. And, uh, but uh, art is very powerful language. This is the language we are using in CPAR gallery to tell our story to the world. In Norwich, you will also see mural of just once in Canada. Uh, and we have recognized him as well. Uh, state have also recognized April 29th as the Declaration of Independence Day to document the Sikh struggle. Uh, but my only thing is, do you think these kind of efforts are helpful in reducing some of the trauma that people are still carrying? And it's generational because we, uh, as the kids have seen, our parents going through a lot. And uh, yes, these efforts are helpful in the healing process as well, and not just uh, uh, limited to the acknowledgements. Thank you. Well, thank you for that um, really, really such an important question. Um, and to what, and it follows from Jason's question about healing. What can we do? Can photographs and tell the truth of something, I think, and what history can do. Now, um, that was your question about history. So history is a very contested thing in India right now. Uh, the the Modi government has a lot of attack on historians that are ongoing. Mainstream historians, they're shutting down the major universities, replacing them by political appointees. Uh, they have attacked Romila Thakur, the eminent historian of medieval India. They're attacking many, many, and they want to replace that history with a, with their own version of events, right? So I think it's important, and I would let Jason, the historians, also talk to the practice of history. But the practice of history is a complex affair, which is takes place with corrections, with consensus across historians, with finding out new archives, new archives can bring new information. So we are constantly changing the story, like what finding out like what actually happened for this archive or these papers come to light and then you have to change the story. So it's constantly evolving. And so the difficulty is of saying that there is one story that does say it's for most time because we don't have access to all the documents. Right? We don't know what this government often did or which politician did. And sometimes you only can find them in their memoirs or, you know, Kissinger papers will tell you all the mischief that Kissinger did around the world, but we're only now finding that out. This is the problem you see. Uh, and we, we don't know the whole story, even though the artists are sort of doing a kind of healing practice of putting this together, of expressing what the job and what people saw, what people built, and how survivors are dealing with it. That's the kind of truth that has to be recorded, right? How people feel, how survivors are surviving, What's happening to Srinagar in that community? What happened in different parts of India when the same kind of violence happened after the assassination? There were many Sikhs killed around India. And we don't quite know that yet. We don't know the full history of that. So we always need more historians. Here's my thing for the historian, just them. We need more historians. We need people, we need our community trained to be historians 
We don't only need them to be engineers and doctors and computer science people. We need them to be trained as historians. So we know these stories. And what will we do if we didn't have all these historians just finding out all this information? Right? What would we do if we didn't have artists? We wouldn't, I mean, we wouldn't know all these things. We would just be, uh, you know, left to not be able to fight this kind of violence. And we, we do it with these images. I do do it with the history. So I think history is a difficult question only because we don't know its fullness at any given moment and we constantly have to find it. But we also know that history can show us a kind of complicating picture of the community. We can show, you know, what happens and, you know, different places. Um, anthropologists do a lot of this. Ethnographies go, can go into villages and see what happened. I did a whole bunch of field work in, in my village, right? To, after 25 years of 84 to find out how the village, the geography of the village changed after 25 years. And that was really illuminating to, to see how social life in the village changed when people left, you know, who came in, who left, what the village became. So these are all really, really, I can't speak more strongly on the importance of social science and historical work to know about what happens to our communities. It's so evocative. Um, and I think that it underscores um, the work, the community work that you've also done and what the Sakar Gallery has done, the, you know, I was at the veiling of the mural in Norwich, and when that, when there is a community of opportunity to reflect, right? It's not just the declaration, it's like a momentary thing, and then that declaration fixes it, right? But then what do you do with the declaration that allows you to continually revisit the self, the, you know, the reflective part, and the mural then becomes a reminder of that, of that work, of coming together, right? And I thought it was so important the way that you linked that history also with the present day invasion of Ukraine, right? To say, this isn't not, this isn't just about remembering our community. This is happening to other communities right now, right? So that, I felt like that's also a part of like connecting across difference on these same levels of like state violence. And there's like two quotes that I use in thinking about like with my students and we talk about um, I think about the cultural politics of history. One is from Viet Thanh Nguyen who said, wars are always fought twice. One on the battlefield and second in history. And and the other is this kind of axiom, I can't remember who said it, but um, that every generation writes their own history because the past is relevant to the next generation in new ways. And also more evidence, more source material is emerges or disappears, right? So I read it differently, right? Yeah, the analytical lens of the interpretive mind that's at work on that form of evidence reveal some maybe a different truth right uh, but not like a singular truth but a, it's multi-dimensional right so i think you know which brings me back to the point i was trying to make about that i think the ways that that the efforts to memorialize and to bring up those those kind of reminders to uh, to continually reinterpret, to continually gauge the the connection to the past, it is it's, that feels healthy to me. But in the context of community, because I think it can also be alienating, 
I think. Um, so, yeah. Another part of it is that's just there is just a history being made up to rule. That's the other history that's being made up, right? The, the history that's made up that, about things that never were, right? Just to say the things that, you know, Modi is saying now, it's just incredibly take history to be out. I don't know that. So, I mean, of course, from our kind of understanding of history, it was complicated and well, it was constant correction and change and documentation. There was just the populist faith narratives that he has given us the language for our children to try to Adam, Bosma, how you gain followers by just false narratives, right? And that's important. When she put the India part, I think that just the vote you get out, I think it's as a deep state, because that has been on the power they, they took all the sick nutrition at that time. It was a big library at that time. They took all the head scripts by our group period at that time. You know, they took a lot of books, trucks and trucks of books from the from that library, and they showed it was burned. They throw the newspaper and burn the whole building. And majority of the six scholars are concerned about that part that they're gonna rewrite the, those those books and bring it back with the fake history and fake stories and stuff, you know, against the, they're going to use all of these books writing by themselves against the Sikhs and trying to show that, oh, Sikh was, Sikhism was not a religion or show like this. You know, this is the, this is what they're concerned about because the, uh, I concern, you know, my thing uh, the, I was talking that it's not like just Modi or, you know, enjoy, but it was a deep state that it's working against a community or want to be one one religion, one nation. That's what they were working on for a long time. Yep. Yep. I, I, I think there is a way in which, if you mean by deep state, I kind of don't know. I don't know. I, don't know. I, I wouldn't say, I think the bureaucracy, for instance, is a colonial bureaucracy. It bends with whichever political will directs it. You know, unfortunately, that's because we don't have disinterested civil servants in India. There are some here which have been destroyed, but um, we don't have them. So I think that there is a very distinct way in which Mrs. Gandhi at the RSS and the company of the BJP. Even the Vajpayee government is different from the Modi government. The Vajpayee government was in rural when 2002 happened, the Gujarat. So even, but Vajpayee was still different from Modi. Yes, yes, he did. Well, the other thing is that none of them could do what Modi has done in Kashmir. Take away all of the strengths. So, so yeah, I think that politicians should not know that elect matters. This talk on a rainy Friday. Um, this has been wonderful, Mr. Graywall. Thank you so much. And uh, this has been an amazing week of six studies, uh, and you know, really want to continue this multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary inquiry, and to continue this this work, uh, not only here at UConn but in uh, all across the state. Uh, so, thank you again to those who came. Um, thank you, Swarnji. Thank you so much for for coming. It's, it means so much to have community here. Um, at the university. So, um, so uh, honestly, thank you, everyone, and have an excellent weekend. Hopefully, maybe drier than what it is today.